Dear viewers, uh, I am Dr. Amit Bhattacharya from Department of Zoology, Ramjas College, University of Delhi. And today I am going to present lecture on the history of modern biotechnology techniques and its application. So in this part of this lecture, I will be talking about what are the modern biotechnology techniques which got developed over the years and how it has been implemented or what are the applications of these modern biotechnology techniques in the current era and the medical field to be precise. Now what exactly the biotechnology is? Now biotechnology is basically using the technology which utilizes the biological system, uh, the living organism or the part of it to develop or create different products. Now this biotechnology, uh, it got enhanced or there is a rapid development of the biotechnology field mainly during the 1970s when the genetic engineering came into the picture in which the scientists were able to make changes means edit it or put some inserts into it into the organism's genetic material. So that's revolutionized the biotechnology field. Now, the today's biotechnology, it covers the various different disciplines of the areas. So, it has got a variety of areas which have been opened up, which includes the genetics, biochemistry, molecular biology. So, all these things are combined and amalgamated to form the biotechnology, which is helping the scientists and the uh, pharma and the uh, scientific companies to develop new technologies and the product every year. Now these have revolutionized or come up with various new forms of medicine, therapies to treat and cure the various diseases, agricultural products such as the genetically modified plants, the biofuels or the industrial biotechnology such as the production of chemicals, paper, textiles and food. So the biotechnology field is one of the most advanced field nowadays which is playing a major role in the development of the economy as well as to cure and, and, and subsidize the healthcare system. Now how exactly the emergence of the biotechnology came into the picture? The term biotechnology was first used in the year 1917 by a Hungarian engineer. His name was Karl Erke. So he for the first time used this particular term for all lines of work by which products are produced from raw material with the help of the living organisms or the living things. So this particular terminology or the definition the scientists gave in the year 1917. Subsequently, in the 1961, another Swedish microbiologist called, they, they nomenclatured or changed a scientific journal name which was initially called as the Journal of Microbial and Biochemical Engineering and Technology to Biotechnology and Bioengineering. So, this gave the foundation or the idea and the conceptualization of the biotechnology terms. Now, what exactly the biotechnology? As I told you, the biotechnology is an amalgamation of the biology and the technology. So we can see in this image the various fields of biology, which includes the molecular biology, microbiology, biochemistry, immunology, genetics. They came into the picture. Now they amalgamate to form the medical biotechnology. This particular medical biotechnology is helping the scientists to come up the various modified forms of crops, drugs or the medicine, the vaccines, the diagnostic kits like the various diagnostic kits which came up during the COVID times and the livestock and it is helping the scientists to come up with various forms which can help sustainability of the human beings. The initial form of the discovery in the biotechnology came in the year 1937 when the, uh, the scientist, he discovered moving boundary electrophoresis over here. Now this moving boundary electrophoresis or came into the picture for which he got the Nobel Prize in the 1948 and it laid the foundation for the electrophoresis assembly. Now this moving boundary electrophoresis was basically a YouTube form chamber in which the two electrodes were put, the positive and the negative and the protein containing buffer was added over here and subsequently the electric charge was passed. So based upon the charging of these proteins, they move towards one particular electrode. For example, if you see the picture, they are moving towards the positive uh, electrode over there. 
So what is happening is the positive boundary is increasing while the negative, uh, the boundary in the negative electrode is decreasing. So that's why it is called as the moving boundary electrophoresis. Now this laid the foundation for the development of the further electrophoresis assembly which were used to identify and uh, segregate the DNA, RNA and the protein samples. Now the first one which was laid the foundation was called as the gel electrophoresis as it is called as gel because there is a gel which is being used for the separation of the molecules which can be the DNA, RNA or the protein based on their molecular sizes. Now in the gel electrophoresis the molecules are separated based on the electrical field through which they are passed on. So the gel contains small pores through which these molecules travel. Now the smaller the molecule is the faster it will move through the gels because there are small pores within these particular gels and through this it can it will reach a longer point while the larger the segment of the DNA is it will travel much slower. So the smaller DNA fragment will travel a greater distance through the gel than a larger DNA molecule. So this gave the conceptualization of the gel electrophoresis and it also revolutionized the biotechnology field. Now this is a diagram of the gel electrophoresis which we can see over here. So what happens is in this gel electrophoresis assembly there are certain wells which are poured into the gels over there. Now there are two uh, electrodes which is there the power supply the cathode and the anode over there. As we know that the DNA samples are loaded onto the top of the wells and subsequently the electric charge are switched on. Now we know that the DNA is negatively charged so it will start moving towards the positively charged and that is how the separation of the DNA fragments which are present in the sample which has been loaded onto the well are separated out. Now as this moves out so what happens is this smaller fragment it moves to a larger greater distance while the larger fragment remains on the top. So there is a constant uh, segregation or the seg uh, separation of these DNA fragments which is taking place. So we can see the bottom image the left hand side image this is a gel electrophoresis assembly which is shown on over here while in the, sub, uh, the middle image it shows how the separation is taking place and the blue kind of thing which is moving up is called as the tracking die. So through which we can track how the separation or the movement of the samples are taking place and finally once the separation are being done the gel is put under the UV lamp and it is observed over there. So we can see over here the bands in which there is a glow which is found over there what is happening is the glow is telling up that the DNA is present in that particular band. So th this gives the image that the DNA is present at that particular band and the first well if we see is a ladder band which gives us a, a standard protocol of what exactly the size would be and the subsequent wells we load our samples and run it subsequently. The next particular discovery was in the year 1953 when the three of the scientists Watson, Crick and Wilkins they came up with a paper which was got published in the year 1953 in the nature. So they for the first time discovered and announced the structure of the DNA double helix structure deoxyribonucleic acid. So for this particular work in the year 1962 three of them were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Now the, if you see the, uh, the image which is on the right hand side is the pa paper snapshot which they published in the nature in the year 1953. Now the next important discovery in the field of biotechnology was in the year 1959 by the two of the scientists uh, Edmund and Porter. They have discovered the, uh, the structure of the antibodies. So the antibody structure was discovered by them and subsequently they got a Nobel Prize for this unique finding in the year 1972 and this Nobel Prize was in the physiology or the medicine. So we can see in the image the structure of the antibody which contains two chain. So the blue part is basically called as the heavy chain while the green part is called as the light chain. Now each of the part are having variable region and a constant region which is there. So based on these region they have been segmented into two parts which is called as the FC region 
and the upper part which is there. Now this discovery of these antibody led to the discovery of many of the subsequent diagnostic kits and the diagnostic processes also. Now these discoveries also ignited the discovery of the B lymphocytes which we know play a very important role as a lymphoid cells. So in our body whenever there is an antigen attack what happens is these B cells gets activated which contains a membrane bound antibody on the top of it. As it gets activated these antibodies are released which neutralizes the antigens within the body. So these antibodies are released from the antibody secreting plasma cells and these neutralizes the antigen. So the discovery of the structure and eliciting the structure of the antibodies plays a very important role in knowing the subsequent processes how exactly the binding of the antigen antibody is taking place, what are the significant roles which are there and subsequently many of the diagnostic kits were discovered based on these particular discoveries. Now another important lymphoid cell is the T lymphocytes which is also uh, one of the important discoveries in the biotechnology. We know that the T lymphocytes are basically majorly of two types, T helper cells and T cytotoxic cell and they play a very important role in neutralizing all the antigens which is present within the body thing. The next important lymphoid cells are the natural killer cells or the NK cells. So NK cells plays a very important role in the host defense both, both against the tumor cells and against the cells which are infected by some virus or the bacterial things. Now these NK cells they expresses a membrane bound receptor which is called as the CD16 receptor which is the main, main attachment region for the FC region of the IgG molecule. So they work in a principle which is called as the antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity. Now the next important discovery was in the year 1970 for which the scientists were given the Nobel Prize in the year 1978 uh, in physiology or medicine. Now this discovery was basically they discovered the restriction enzymes. Now the restriction enzymes are a very important part of the system nowadays in the biotechnology. These enzymes are basically uh, isolated from the bacteria and the RK system and these enzyme has got a very peculiar uh, characteristic that they recognizes specific short nucleotide sequences and cuts the DNA at the precise location. So that important property was used by these scientists to uh, work upon the molecular gene cloning and the other subsequent techniques. Now the restriction enzymes have been classified into various other forms. Now the restriction endonucleus many a times is referred as the molecular scissors. So the restriction enzymes are called as the molecular scissors as they cleave the DNA near or at the specific uh, recognition sites. Now these recognition sites are referred as the restriction sites and these enzymes can make an incision on the DNA double helix structure and once the incision is being made then a foreign insert DNA can be incorporated over here. So if you see the image over here this image shows that how the, uh, the target DNA which is present over here the target DNA it is being uh, cut with the help of the restriction enzyme. So there is a staggered end which is produced in the target DNA as well as the plasmid DNA it is also cut with the help of the restriction enzyme. So once the cut has been made the, with the help of the staggered ends on the eye, both the target DNA as well as the plasmid DNA they are ligated. So we form the recombinant DNA which includes the plasmid DNA which will help the, uh, the particular insert to be replicated in the bacterial system and the insert DNA which is attached to it. So this forms the recombinant DNA part and then it is transformed or transferred into the plates where it replicates and a number of copies of these particular things are formed and then subsequently it can be screened with the help of the various screening techniques and the sequences can be matched with the help of the sequencers. Now 
the two important uh, ends which are produced by these restriction endonucleases one is called as the staggered end cleavage the other one is called as the blunt end cleavage now in the staggered end cleavage what happens is the example which is given up over here is the eco r1 so we can see over here there is a uh, restriction uh, recognition sites which is gaattc so what happens is it cuts uh, from the uh, G part okay now as the cut is being made we can see that the two DNA segments they get separated and there is a overhanging arm which is there so it is called as a staggered end cleavage while in the case of the blunt end cleavage what happens is the cut takes place but there is a blunt end which is produced so there is no overhanging arm which is there so the restriction endonucleases have been classified into two forms majorly staggered end cleavage restriction endonuclease and the blunt end cleavage restriction endonuclease and more than 3700 type 2 restriction endonucleases with about different recognition sites have been isolated from the various bacteria. So now they are playing a very important role in the biotechnology field and especially in the recombinant DNA technology and the gene cloning uh, etc experiments. Now if we see over here the various uh, enzymes are shown over here ECOR1, HIN3, BAMH1, SAU3A, he too. So, we can see they are cutting the DNA at the various uh, cleavage patterns. So, some of them are cutting the DNA in a staggered end cleavage pattern while some of them are cutting the DNA in a blunt end DNA pattern. So, based on what exactly is the requirement for that particular biotechnology experiments, the restriction endonucleases are being used over here. Now, the next question which comes is, as they are being isolated from the bacterial system, why doesn't the bacteria destroy their own DNA with these restriction enzymes which is present within their system mechanism? Now, the answer to this is the methylation process. Now, what happens is, if we see the image on the left hand side, that is showing a normal restriction endonuclease recognition site which is being cut or the cleave with the help of the restriction endonucleases but in the case of the bacterial system what it does very intelligently is it methylates certain important uh, nucleotides within these restriction endonuclease sites or the recognition site as the methylation takes place what happens is the restriction endonuclease is unable to recognize these site and cut the sites over there now, as the cut does not take place, so what happens is the bacterial DNA, DNA remains intact. It is not cleaved or auto cleaved by its own restriction enzymes which is present within them. Now, the restriction fragment analysis or the restriction enzymes have been utilized in the various identification of the various important disease conditions. One of them is, is shown over here which is called as the sickle cell anemia over here. So, we have heard about this particular thing and it takes place majorly through the beta globin gene which is present within the globin locus. Now, what happens is if you see over here the normal beta globin gene it has got two important restriction recognition cut sites within them with the, of that particular enzyme. But in the case of the sickle cell anemia there is presence of only one of this particular restriction endonuclease site while the other one has been lost due to a, a mutation within these particular nucleotide sequences. So, what happens is if we cut the normal uh, beta globin uh, gene so, and it, uh, we run it under the gel what we will find is we will find three bands over there because with the help of the two endonucleases cut sites there will be three fragments which will be produced but in the case of the sickle cell alleles over there as there is presence of only one restriction endonuclease site within the beta globin gene what will happen is we will find only two fragments over there now this particular thing it helps the scientists to identify whether the beta globin gene is having three fragment or two fragment so they can easily classify that wherever there is a presence of three fragment 
this is a normal allele of the beta globin gene while in the case where there are two fragments which are present there is a presence of the sickle cell allele within that particular person. So, this restriction endonuclease is laid the foundation for such kind of analysis and the diagnostic kits also. Now, the next important kit or the diagnostic measure which got developed in the after 1970s was called as the enzyme linked immunosorbent assay. So, this particular assay was a very important assay uh, which was discovered by the scientist in the year 1971 uh, who were working in the Stockholm University, they discovered this assay. Now, this assay have been classified into three major form, indirect ELISA, direct ELISA and the sandwich ELISA. Now, we will see how this particular ELISA technique in which the antibodies were used to analyze whether a particular antigen is present within the patient or whether the particular antibody against a specific virus is present within the patient is analyzed by this particular assay. So, we will discuss about two important disease condition, one is the HIV, the other one is the malaria. So, how this particular technology helped the scientists to discover or come up with a kit which help them to analyze these particular disease condition. The first one we come up is the indirect ELISA which is now actively used to screen the serum antibody produced within the body of the patient against the human immunodeficiency virus which is the causative agent of the AIDS. Now, we, they detect the presence of the serum antibody. What happens is first the ELISA well plates are prepared into which there is an antigen uh, encoded well which is there or the coated well which is there. Now, the patient uh, serum is, is taken up which contains the antibody which has been produced against the specific human immunodeficiency virus, the HIV virus which is the causative agent of the AIDS. Now, these are then sampled out and they are put onto these well. If the person is having the uh, HIV infection, what will happen is the body will have a high titer of the serum antibodies within its circulation. Now, this serum antibodies are then attached to these antigen coated wells over there. Now, once they are attached, the secondary antibodies are added which contain certain chromophores which are there. Now, once the secondary antibody goes and binds to this primary antibody which was isolated from the samples loaded onto the well, they give a colored reaction. So, we can see over here what happens is this is a serum antibody which is taken from the blood of the person and we try to detect whether the person is having the antibodies for the HIV virus circulating within the blood circulation. Now, if we see this particular image result over here, it shows that the patient A does not have any antibodies within his circulation for the HIV react. HIV infection. So, it clarifies or confirms that the patient A is not suffering from the HIV infection. While if we see the patient B and patient C sample over here, we can see a colored reaction which is there. So, this is basically because the secondary antibody were able to bind to the primary antibody and give a colored reaction over there. So, this confirms both the patient B and C are having the uh, HIV infection, uh, they are into the HIV infection mode and they have got an infection of, of the human uh, immunodeficiency virus within them. Now, the titer or the dilution or the presence of the serum antibody can be also checked with the help of the various measures. So, over here if you see there is a 1 is to 2 dilution, 1 is to 20, 10 dilution, 1 is to 100 dilution. So, this gives a scientist a overview how much is the quantity of the serum antibody which is present within the blood samples against these HIV virus infection. Now, the next important method which is there is called as the sandwich ELISA. Now, in the sandwich ELISA have been used for the falciparum malaria and it is used to check whether the person sample is having the antigens which are specific to the falciparum malaria. Now, what happens is in this a well is coated with an antigen and onto this well the uh, patient samples are loaded. Now, if the patient sample are having the falciparum malaria specific antigen, they will bind to these antibody and once the binding takes place, the secondary antibodies are added and 
as the secondary antibodies are added, there will be a colored reaction which will be given and that particular sample region will be uh, giving a colored reaction. So, that confirms that the person is suffering from the falciparum malaria condition and there is a presence of antigen within the blood sample collected from that particular patient. So, we see saw that how important the ELISA technique have become in the development of the various diagnostic kits or the diagnostic measures which are being used for the various disease conditions nowadays. Now, the recombinant DNA technology also played a very important role in this particular thing and both the scientists Boyer and Cohen played a very important role and they first discussed about this recombinant DNA technology in the year 1973 in which in a plasmid DNA, in a plasmid there can be an insert DNA which can be incorporated and this particular recombinant DNA can then subsequently transferred onto a bacteria and it can be translocated and replicated over there. So, this led to the foundation for the recombinant DNA technology. Now, with this note, we come to the end of the first part of the lecture. In the second part also of the lecture, we will continue with the subsequent another part of the history of the various modern biotechnology techniques and how important they are playing an important role in the modern uh, development of the diagnostic kits and the treatment and cure for the various disease conditions. So, with this note, I come to the end of the lecture. Thank you very much.